In 1998, people of the United States were shocked and terrified by the murder of a young man, Matthew Shepard. Matthew was a young guy from Wyoming State. His murder brought together the entire country, and thousands of people wanted justice and the feeling of safety. However, while there were people who mourned Matthew, a group of people kept saying that he deserved to be killed. Everything because he was gay. Hello everyone and welcome back into the room where even walls have ears. Thank you very much for clicking on this video and I hope you will like it. First of all, I want to welcome all new members of my channel. Welcome into the room where I share some true crime stories with you. I want to thank you for watching my videos and subscribing to my channel. I want you to know that your support means so much to me. Thank you very much. Today's story is an unusual one. Today I will tell you about Matthew Shepard, a guy who became an angel of thousands of people by sacrificing himself. What happened to him? Why would such a boy with a bright personality be killed? If you also want to find out, stay tuned, and we are starting right away. Wyoming is one of the biggest states in the USA. Even so, it is one of the smallest states by population. Moreover, this state in the 90s was one of the conservative ones. Back in the 70s and 80s, the people in the countryside were pretty identical. If you were a stereotypical tough cowboy, you would fit into the standards. Otherwise, you would be called a faggot, the word depicting you as a different person and even as a loser. In Cusper City in Wyoming, Matthew Wayne Shepard was born on December 1, 1976. His mother says that, as a young kid, he was very sensitive, emotional and empathetic child. As it generally happens with gay men, most of his friends were girls. Girls trusted, appreciated and loved him. He was the type of a person who could start communicating with absolutely everyone. In school, he was very active in different disciplines, and he especially enjoyed the debates and politics. His friends were especially mentioning his beautiful and beaming smile. He was giving that positive vibe that could melt your heart and help you to get rid of the negativity. He was kind of a boy next door. The parents of Matthew started wondering about the difference of their son when he was a child. His mother, Judy Shepard, said that Matthew's favorite Halloween costume was Dolly Parton. But generally, growing up, Matthew Shepard was a normal child and later a teenager, but just a little bit different. At the beginning of the 90s, his life changed. In 1993, Matthew's father got a job in an oil company in Saudi Arabia. Thus, the family had to move. But this was not moving from one city to another. That was changing the country of residence and even moving to a different continent. Matthew started attending an American school in Lugano, Switzerland. While he was studying there, Matthew started exploring neighboring countries with his friends. They have been to Venice and Milan and even visited Morocco. Matthew was having a great time in Europe. Back in the 90s, Morocco was not the best destination for tourists. One night, Matthew, as any normal tourist, decided to go out and look around. But the mistake was, Matthew decided to do that alone. A couple of men from Morocco snatched him, took to an isolated place and raped him. Since that was a random attack, even though Matthew notified his parents and the police, authorities couldn't find the attackers. Matthew was traumatized and his spiritual and emotional development were lost. He simply lost a sense of safety. Matthew was very disappointed. In 1995, Matthew graduated from high school and returned to the States. Then he decided to come out to his mother. Matthew was finally feeling comfortable after coming out. He was not afraid since the 90s in the States can be marked as a boom in LGBTQ representation. Gay characters started appearing in TV shows and movies. That was the era of changes. After a while, Matthew moved to Casper, Wyoming, the place where he was born. There he was trying to meet other gay people. The life seemed nice, but it was not easy for Matthew at all. 
He was still suffering from depression. Some days he was super funny and everything was amazing. Other days it was the total opposite. He was keeping a journal and there he was sharing his thoughts and feelings. His bones with his family were so tight that in his journal he would literally write how he was missing his home and his family. In the letter to his mother, Matthew was writing that he was very depressed. He was writing about how he was missing his home and about how his adaptation was going. In spring he moved to Laramie since he was enrolled in Wyoming University. That is the very university where his parents were once attending. Overall, life in Laramie was good for Matthew. He met like-minded people over there and was generally enjoying the student life. On October 6, 1998, Matthew Shepard went to an LGBTQ meeting. After having a great time with people at the meeting, they decided to grab drinks and maybe have a dinner. After spending time with his friends in the place named Village Inn, Matthew decided he didn't want to return home yet. Later, his friends knew that Matthew was spending time in the bar named Fireside. 10.30 p.m. Matthew walked into the Fireside Lounge. He was feeling himself safe because that was the place that Matthew was familiar with. He didn't need to feel uncomfortable or anxious. Back then, there were no designated gay bars in the entire state. But the Fireside Bar was the place where gay people would gather from time to time. According to the bartender in Fireside, the night Matthew was there, other two guys who were visiting Fireside from time to time showed up. They bought their drinks with coins. Since Matthew was a person with an extroverted personality, seems he got to know those two guys. Later, bartender said that Matthew left the bar with those two men. Even though bartender didn't see the faces of those two men, he was sure that those were the same guys who procured their pictures with coins. The bartender later in the interview said that he was blaming himself for inaction. The night Matthew left the bar with those two guys, he didn't think twice about that. Had he, maybe Matthew would be alive. October 7, 1998, 12.40 a.m. A resident woke up because of the hissing sound. He went to the source and saw that the tire of his automobile was slashed. He called the police and reported on property vandalism. One police officer, Flint Waters, was the first officer who headed to the place. Four blocks from the house where tires were slashed, he saw two guys who were acting strangely. They were sitting in their vehicle and were not moving. It was past midnight and there were not a lot of people outside. So, the police officer thought they might be intruders he was looking for. Guys after seeing the police tried to flee, but the officer caught up with one of them and eventually arrested him. It was Russell Henderson. Russell was living with his grandmother since his mother had some issues. He was from a normal family and was a normal kid. He was dating a girl named Chastity Paisley. When Russell was arrested, there was blood on him. The officer asked about it, and the explanation was confusing. Henderson said that they were jumped by two men, one of whom was white and the other Hispanic. After the incident, the two guys run off, said Russell. Then the police officer asked about the property vandalism report, but Russell refused any allegations and said that he was not involved in automobile tire slashing. He refused to reveal the name of the other guy, whom the officer just saw. However, after the persistence of the police officer, Russell told the name of the second guy, who was Aaron McKinney. Aaron was from Laramie and grew up there. His parents were divorced. He was dating Kristen Price and they had a baby. His mother died because of complications of the disease. He got a quite a bit of money from the insurance. Instead of using money wisely, he was spending it on drugs and poor behavior. He was behaving like a bad boy, and with his money in his pocket, he started procuring prohibited substances and eventually got addicted to methamphetamine. After talking to Russell, the police started looking for those two men that Russell had mentioned. The police officers were sure that those two men were involved in not only property vandalism, but also in the accident that Russell and Aaron had. 
After the ambulance took Russell to the Ibison Memorial Hospital, the officers started examining the truck. He saw a lot of odd things, including blood spatter on the truck and a bloody gun. The police were suspicious that there was something more that Russell hid from them. They took the evidence. In the cab of the truck, they found a very nice pair of shoes that seemed out of place. After the search continued, they found a debit card with a name on it. Matthew Shepard. Meanwhile, Aaron was hiding in his girlfriend's place. She was the person who called the police and said that Aaron was injured very badly. He was hospitalized so that doctors could treat his head injuries. Then police went to the hospital where he had been treated. There they happened to know that Matthew Shepard was found on the outskirts of the city and was moved to the same hospital. Matthew Shepard was discovered on October 7, 1998 at 6.23 a.m. He was bloody from the top of his head down to the mid-chest. He was tied to the fence and was in a coma for about 18 hours before he was discovered by a cyclist named Aaron Kreifels. Kreifels first mistook Matthew for a scarecrow, but when he realized he was shocked and immediately reported to the police. Shepard was first transported to Iveson Memorial Hospital in Laramie. He had suffered fractures to the back of his head and in front of his right ear. He experienced severe brainstem damage, which affected his body's ability to regulate his heart rate, body temperature, and other vital functions. There were also about a dozen small lacerations around his head, face, and neck. His injuries were deemed too severe for doctors to operate. After he was discovered, the police went to the scene. The blood was spattered throughout the entire scene and that was showing the brutality of the attack. One of the police officers, Reggie Flutie, found the student identification card of Wyoming University laying on the ground with the name on it, Shepard, Matthew Shepard. The police started putting all pieces of a puzzle together. They knew that Russell Henderson, and Aaron McKinney were somehow related to that case. Doctors were trying to do everything to save the life of Matthew Shepard, but he was beaten severely. Everyone there was shocked at how he could still be alive. Parents who were still in Saudi Arabia were told horrifying news, and they tried to return to the States as soon as possible. He was transferred to Podre Valley Hospital in Fort Collins, Colorado, which specialized in head injuries, with the hope doctors could help him. On October 8, everyone from Matthew's surroundings got to know what had happened to Matthew. His friends were terrified and they knew that the motive of the attack was hate. Someone did this to Matthew because he was gay. That day, four people were interrogated. Russell Henderson, Aaron McKinney, and their girlfriends, Chastity Paisley and Kristen Price. Kristen was the very first person who started talking. She revealed that Aaron came to her place that night and told that he thought he killed someone. Now let's restore the chronology of events the night when Matthew was kidnapped. That night, Russell and Aaron were standing not far from the fireside bar when they noticed someone who they thought was gay. That person was Matthew. They needed some cash, so they came up with a plan to pretend they were gays too. Aaron said that Matthew seemed rich, so they decided to rob him. Eventually, Matthew left the bar with Russell and Aaron. After they left the bar, they sat in the truck that belonged to Aaron's father. Matthew sat between them and Russell was driving. Matthew started touching Aaron's leg and groin. Aaron was holding a gun at that time. He pulled it out and started hitting Matthew with it. Russell drove them to the side and tied Matthew to the fence, and Aaron started to hit him even more aggressively. Aaron said that it was like somebody else was doing it. He simply couldn't stop, even though Matthew was begging him to stop. After Aaron stopped beating Matthew, both thought that Matthew was dead. So they got into the truck and headed back to the city, trying to get rid of first of all the gun. But they got into the fight that left bruises and scars on them. Aaron ran to his girlfriend's place. He threw the wallet of Matthew, putting it in a dirty diaper. 
They threw the clothes of the victim into the dumpster. The shoes that the police found were not thrown away because they were very expensive. One by one, the police managed to gather all the belongings of Matthew. People who were interrogating Aaron later stated that he didn't seem remorseful even a little. Moreover, they are sure that up to this day he is not remorseful at all. Meanwhile, the parents of Aaron Shepherd arrived at the hospital, and they saw their child for the first time in such a condition. No one back then realized the resonance this story would create. This was a huge wave that crossed the entire country. All the newspapers were writing about Matthew Shepard. His face was on every national TV channel. People wanted Matthew's story to be known. Sexual minority groups were trying to use mass media to highlight the story of Matthew to protect thousands of other people. Many, many people were hoping that Matthew would survive. The time stopped for everyone, especially for his parents. Russell Henderson and Aaron McKinney were charged with three counts of kidnapping, aggravated robbery, and first-degree attempted murder. Their girlfriends were charged with being an accessory after the fact to attempted first-degree murder. On the 10th of October, almost 150 people started marching, wearing yellow armbands, with the writing "Hate is not a Laramie value." Even though thousands of people were praying for Matthew, his condition kept getting worsening day by day. On October 12, the president of the Podre Valley Hospital, where Matthew was being treated during the conference, announced that at 12:53 a.m., Matthew Shepard died after his blood pressure began to drop and his condition continued to deteriorate. People's hearts were broken. After that, the charges against Russell, Aaron, and their girlfriends were upgraded from attempted first-degree murder to first-degree murder and accessory after the fact to first-degree murder, respectively. Thousands of people were mourning the death of Matthew Shepard in small towns and big cities. People were rallying and demanding freedom. They wanted to make sure that no one else would repeat the unfortunate destiny of Matthew. Well-known people, including Ellen DeGeneres, and even country authorities, presented their own speeches on everything that was happening. But not everyone was supporting Matthew and his family. There was a group of people who came to the funeral of Matthew Shepard not to show their support, but to protest. Their leader was Fred Phelps. They were protesting against the LGBTQ community. Their banners were filled with messages of hatred and outrage. Most of them were very devoted visitors to the church. The protesters, with their leader Fred Phelps, even showed up during the trial of Russell Henderson, held on April 9, 1999. The defense attorney Wyatt Skaggs was trying everything to prevent the death penalty. Of course, the defense said that none of this would have happened if Matthew Shepard didn't touch Aaron McKinney. They used the so-called gay panic defense. The defense tried to show Aaron McKinney as a victim of sexual abuse, someone who was assaulted, and that's why he defended himself, though it was a horrible way of defense. Instead, he would say no to Matthew, and there was no need to beat him to death. Everyone was expecting the maximum punishment, the death penalty, but that was not what Aaron got. This decision was made by the parents of Matthew, Dennis and Judy Shepard. They wanted to give McKinney life. In the emotional address to the court, the father of Matthew, Dennis Shepard, said, "You robbed me of something precious, Mr. McKinney. I gave you life in the memory of one who no longer lives. May you have a long life." And may you thank Matthew every day for it. Both Aaron McKinney and Russell Henderson were sentenced to two consecutive life imprisonments with no possibility of parole. Chastity Paisley pleaded guilty to accessory after the fact and was sentenced to 18 months to three years in prison. Kristen Price pleaded guilty to police interference and was sentenced to one year of probation. After the murder of Matthew Shepard, even the president started talking. The country was willing to talk. The legislation of hate crime was one of the priorities of the activists. The Matthew Shepard Foundation was formed. 
one of the driving forces of that foundation was to legislate the punishment against hate crimes. People were trying to erase the hate through the legislation. The case of Matthew Shepard was interlinked with the case of James Byrd Jr., who was killed on racism hate. The racism hate and homophobic hate. People became voices of those two men, who were killed because they were who they were. In 2007, activists partially succeeded. The Matthew Shepard Hate Crime Act was introduced to the Senate and after passing the House, it was attached to the Defense Authorization Act. But the President Bush said that he would veto the Defense Authorization Act if the Hate Crime Act was attached to the main document. Thus, Matthew Shepard Hate Crime Act was removed and died on the floor. Only in October 2009, President Barack Obama signed the Matthew Shepard and James Byrd Jr. hate crimes prevention into law. People and especially representatives of minorities throughout the country finally felt safe. This is pretty much everything I wanted to share with you this time. Thank you very much if you watched this video till the very end. What happened to Matthew Shepard was gruesome, but it was also a key turning point. As I mentioned at the beginning of this video, Matthew Shepard became an angel by sacrificing his own life to save thousands of other people's lives. Unfortunately, these type of murders are more frequent not in the United States but in other countries. But people do not talk about them because they are afraid. We people must be sure that this type of crime won't be repeated once again. To be honest, this story broke my heart when I was preparing materials uh, for this video. Of course, there are much more details uh, that I couldn't include here, otherwise the video would be like two hours long. Uh, if you want to read more about the case, I will leave some titles of documentaries and books, so feel free to check the description box below. If you want to share your own opinion on this case, feel free to leave your comments in the comment section below. If you want to support my channel and my work, you can just click the like button and subscribe to my channel. Remember that everyone deserves to love and to be loved. Take care of yourselves and see you next time. Stopping. Okay, everybody, here we go. Can everybody hear me? Okay, there's going to be a lot of people out there saying a lot of really horrible things about Matthew, and you're going to want to respond. But remember, there's a big difference between what people say and what things are. So earplugs in <laughs> and keep smiling. Remember, you're Matthew's angels.